hi everyone. My name is Jean. Um, I'm a software engineering student. So immediately when I saw the list of projects that were available, my immediate attraction was to like using AI for science communication because we care a lot about how we communicate science, particularly the new science that's coming around with AI and large language models and just the narratives that come to it. So I was incredibly interested immediately uh, to start working on this project. Um, what ended up happening was we were trying to use those AI tools that are available um, at everybody's uh, disposal, let's say. Uh, so for example, AI tools like ChatGBT or others that were used to, like we used to create videos, um, for example, in video, and there were a bunch of others because I had to combine them to make sure that they were working out well. Um, I'm sure as all of you know, in preparing yourselves for giving your speeches and like preparing your presentation, that figuring out the best way to communicate your project and your science to the general public or to communities that are researchers or people who are interested in that specific area, for example, astrobiology or space science uh, is really crucial, especially if you want to make sure that you're up to speed in your own uh, background and you want to make sure that what they're getting from your research is what you want from it. So um, obviously the reason that uh, we decided to focus on this specific thing is the idea that the current pace at which scientific research is being produced is really high. Um, and there's a large volume of just research out there that you cannot like possibly fit in even in your own literature review. And a lot of those research papers don't make it through to the general public because of the high density of technical jargon that is there. And it's not necessarily accessible, whether it's through resources or otherwise. So we were trying to figure out a way um, and making sure that whoever accesses these uh, this information is what the researchers intend, intended with it. So uh, the way that I went about it was to use my own understanding of how research works. So um, whether the researcher is, imply, is employing um, explicit research questions or uh, are they implicit? What are the interlocutors that they're responding to? What's the gap in the area of science that they're trying to respond to? And what are the implications according to the researcher? Uh, so uh, for my process that I went through is I chose a credible website such as SciWorthy. And honestly, I relied heavily on SciWorthy because of the like really well done structure of their writing. And also because they already cite to the original research paper, um, I started reading about eight research papers. I chose eight niche ones, uh, such as like uh, articles of neuroscience, and uh, there was an astrophysics one, there was one for chess and math. Um, I read the original research paper, and then I started giving it to chat uh, to kind of answer some questions. I will show you the prompts that I used because we use prompt engineering alone. Um, and then I started comparing it to the article that was written by SciWorthy, and I reiterated the process until I felt like the article that was being produced was readable, but also it still stayed true to the original research paper, maintained some of the main important points made in the literature review, and also like the implications according to the researcher. Uh, I then used these articles to generate AI videos. Um, so the AI videos that I generated, I didn't like some of the videos, so I would swap some of the videos uh, using stock videos. And then I started posting it online, so on Instagram and on TikTok. Uh, the TikTok ended up doing really well because I think I use about $5 of promotion and uh, I checked it again today and it's at 6,000 likes for just eight videos um, on those topics. And it seems to be really doing really well. So I'm excited to show you the results uh, in a bit. But one of the cool things that I figured out when I was like looking through it and with Dr. Sasha, we talked about uh, some knobs that we can use in our prompts to kind of ensure that what is being produced can 
change according to the audience or whether it is engaging or not. So some of the knobs that we ended up using, for example, was, you know, like the tone, we would say use it for a general public or um, tone it for researchers. My audience is a researcher. The tone needs to be professional. We asked it to use some metaphors and explaining some difficult concepts, which you will be able to see in the videos. Um, we then used cadence for like um, general public would require uh, cadences that are more rhythmic and inter interesting over like a research audience. Um, we focused on transparency. We asked it to explain a lot of the jargons or remove them. Um, figure out other ways to explain it while still staying true to what the research and the implications of the paper may be. Um, I would like to actually credit um, Dr. Aubrey for the active voice one because during the time that I was working on this, she gave her speech on um, science writing for the public. Uh, and then this is an example of one of the prompts that we use. If you can see, we're asking for the research question. We didn't necessarily ask it to tell us whether it's implicit or explicit. Um, I focused necessarily, necessarily, I focused on the idea that whether they have justified narrowing their scope, because that's the area where the researcher often argues their case, and it makes for good storytelling when you're making the content itself. And then um, I asked it to tell us what the researcher is thinking the implications of that research may be, what is the possible future research that may come from it? Sorry, that's my mom. That's not <laughs> no. All right. So then the objective was obviously to unpack, you know, just how the research is being produced or not. Um, and then whether it's provocative enough to actually interact, create interactivity within the videos itself. Um, and so what I ended up learning is that it's a it's a very cool way and quick way to create videos like short for, short uh short form videos or long form videos because i tried both ways in the long form videos you will be able to see that it focuses a lot on talking about the results um what some uh, of the jargon means and then the shorter form it focuses on just engaging the audience a lot more um these are the topics and as you can see the engagements are pretty high um, I just updated these screenshots um, from the actual TikTok account uh, that we, the main TikTok account that we use to promote the videos. Um, they seem to be doing really well and a lot of people are interacting with it, asking questions, <laughs> which I found interesting. Uh, I also left the original research papers uh, titles under each of the videos. I made sure that whoever is looking at these content knows that, first of all, it's AI generated, but it's using actual um, research papers that are being published recently. And as you can see, a lot of the people that were looking at the videos were like non-followers from a variety of ages, which is to be expected. I think TikTok promotes regionally. Um, I, I think it would have done a lot better even um, from, from the fact that where I live, not a lot of people are English speakers. Um, they're mostly Arabic and Kurdish speakers, which is what my colleague worked on, um, Broda, which you'll be able to see her video. I think Dr. Graham is posting it on how to like make AI generated content uh, for science communication, particularly in Arabic or other languages. But even with that, it did really well. Uh, as you can see over here, this is just a screenshot from one of the video's analytics. And um, I think looking ahead, um, this is a really good way to increase accessibility, to ensure that whoever is about to read your research paper uh, can read it before uh, with, with an understanding for what you're trying to tell them. Uh, but it focuses a lot more through this pattern of like uh, understanding what the research questions are and what um, what the results are, what the, what the researcher thinks the implications of their paper is uh, through like heavy language analysis. Uh, that way, when they're reading your research paper, they know what to expect. Uh, and it's a really good way to target uh, different audiences from uh, different backgrounds or with different niche, um, niche interests in different areas of science, uh, which is like, uh, first of all, 
if you were to use it in a different uh, medium, for example, podcasts or longer form YouTube, it can attract even more interest, garner more scientific uh, interest and forces um, a lot more people to follow their path into science uh, through just interest in what all the cool science that's being produced. Uh, so if you have any questions, please let me know. Let me just stop sharing this here. I don't know if I was sharing the whole time. Was I? I should. <laughs> All right. So does anyone have questions? Sorry. My mom coming in kind of threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's totally fine. Great job. Um, wow, that's a lot of engagement for a few videos. And I mean, honestly, that's pretty impactful for such a short period of time to build that much growth while also sharing real science. And I love that it's based on Cyworthy. Um, that's so cool. Nice you. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Any engagements you'd like to share? I would love if you guys have any questions because I know I was thrown off a little. Bonus points when moms, pets, and kids uh, make an appearance <laughs> in videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My my mom is a linguist, she's an Arabic linguist, and she had a lot of criticism of what I was doing because she knows that um, like LLMs like Gemini and ChatGBT do not do really well with Arabic or my native language. And she was like, why don't you, you know, try to do it? I was like, somebody uh, in our team is already doing it. And also because it's we don't have enough trading data to just do that with Arabic for now. Um, I think they're working on it, though. I saw like a documentary about it. That's really cool. And I wouldn't be surprised that there, there's multiple people out there building their own LLMs right now um, right. focused on Arabic. There's a lot of folks who are doing really cool things with building their own versions um, of these large language models now based on some of the available huge training sets that are out there. And so the big thing is getting an actual training set to build it from that someone has contributed significantly to. And then also, of course, there's a lot of arguments of having permission <laughs> to use things for your training set, which has been an issue for companies. Mm -hmm. uh, like like open ai and others right yeah the so actually that was one of the concerns that we spoke of because of the ethics module of should we ask it to generate its own research papers and then we decided there are enough uh, research papers that are available and i'm sure a lot of those researchers would like that uh to be to be made through like and heard or more people to read what they're publishing um so it was interesting to actually bring those research papers and first reading it, trying to figure out just through the way that it was written, through the format of the paper, and what they actually outright state. A lot of the papers, they say, you know, this is the question we're trying to answer. This is why it's important. And we wanted to make sure that it rings through into like those videos that are being used. Uh, I'm actually going to link the, the, the account uh, so that if anybody wants to take a look at the videos, the tone and everything is really funny sometimes. And you, you can control that, but I wanted to make sure that a lot of people can understand it and engage with it. So, yeah.